Thank you everyone and welcome to the Wednesday, July 20, 2022 meeting of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors. I wanna call this meeting to order right here at 6.30. Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn, I chair the board this year. Before we proceed with uh, the roll call, uh, Melinda, I just want to welcome, don't know if they're in the meeting yet, but I wanna welcome our new members and or alternates to the meeting. Uh, first, we have Paul Sutton, who is a new member for the town of Morrison, but is returning, uh, so his appointment is new. Adam Way is the new alternate for the town of Morrison. And uh, the third person here to welcome is Cheryl Wink, uh, who we've welcomed before, new returning alternate for the city of Englewood. I believe I have everyone who is a new uh, director or alternate. And with that, uh, Melinda, let's proceed with the roll call. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And um, obviously, if you are a member that we're still trying to bring people over, if you're not able to respond when your name is called, I promise you, uh, I'll ask for hands to be raised and we'll make sure that you're recognized. All right, here we go. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Here. William Lindstedt, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. Here. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Webb Sill, Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp, Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Smith, Arvada. Here. Allison Coombs, Aurora. Mike Kaufman, Aurora. Royce Pindell of Bennett. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Here. Margot Ramson of Bomar. Jan Plowski of Brighton. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Here. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Mike Sutherland of Centennial. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Thank you. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Susan Noble of Commerce City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Good evening. Thank you. Nathaniel Sierra of Inglewood. Cheryl Wink of Inglewood. Ari Harrison of Erie. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Jones of Foxfield. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Rich Barrows of Georgetown. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman of Golden. Here. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Shrezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. David Ott of Lock Bowie. Wynne Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. 
Joan Peck of Longmont. Here. Ashley Stolzman of Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Here. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. David Adams of Mead. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Adam Way of Morrison. Meredith Lighty of Northland. Here. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Julia Marvin of Thornton. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. Here. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Glad to be here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and with that, uh, I would ask if there's anyone that wasn't able to respond, if you could go ahead and raise your hand for me really quick. Okay, uh, on attendee side, I do see Sonia Jensen. Um, Sonia, we've been trying to promote you. Um, I don't know if you're using dual monitors, but there should be a pop-up. Uh, if you are on a cell phone, uh, we may not be able to promote you, uh, but we'll try from there. Uh, other, anyway, we will make sure you're unmuted and allowed to participate. Uh, on the panelist side, we have Allison Coombs, George Teal, Rebecca White, Margo Ramson, Neil Shaw, Bill Van Meter, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I do believe that we have a quorum. Should be used to that by now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melinda. Uh, welcome everybody to, uh, to our monthly meeting. Again, obviously we're here virtually. Uh, we have a lot of business to go through and let me start with item three on the agenda, which is uh, to ask for from, a, uh, from members a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Uh, if you want to make that motion, I see uh, Director Harmon uh, makes the motion and uh, Director Starker is seconding, I'm, I'm assuming. Excellent. Okay. Um, all in favor of approving tonight's agenda, please unmute and say aye. 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 If anyone is opposed, please unmute and say nay. Thank you for, for hearing none. And uh, I, I assume there's no abstentions, but I have to ask her, is anybody abstain on such a mundane motion? Hearing none, uh, the agenda is unanimously approved. I wanna move on quickly to a uh, report of the chair. And uh, as you all know, if you've been following us, uh, our work sessions and all the briefings we've had on uh, greenhouse gas and uh, the 2050 Metrovision RTP, I want to announce tonight uh, as required that uh, the Denver Regional Council of Governments has scheduled a public hearing for September 7, 2022 at 4 p.m. to receive comments on the revised 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and associated air quality conformity determinations and greenhouse gas transportation report documents. The public hearing format will be determined according to Dr. Cog procedures based on regional COVID-19 conditions at that time. Uh, further information about the public hearing will be available on Dr. Cog's website on August 7, 2022, which is the beginning of the public comment period. And that concludes my report. Let me move on to report of the Performance and Engagement uh, Committee and uh, Director Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, tonight, the PE group discussed the board director collaborative assessment. That is the survey where we evaluate ourselves and how well we work together. The survey will be slightly shorter than last year, and we encourage your participation in the survey. We also discussed the annual performance evaluation process for our executive director. Uh, this survey will be available in September and will be uh, uh, familiar to you if you completed the survey last year. This is a separate survey from the one that I mentioned above, and we value your feedback on this 
um, this survey evaluating our executive director. Even if you're a newer board member, we encourage your time to um, participate in the survey and provide some written con comments within the survey format. Mr. Chair, that uh, completes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Director Shaw. Next up is a report of the Finance and Budget Committee, and we have uh, Director Baker giving that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This evening, uh, the uh, Finance and Budget Committee met, and I want to say thank you to Director Mulvey for chairing the meeting last month. I was not able to be there. So we approved the minutes. We had three action items originally. Um, Executive Director Rex asked us to um, postpone discussion of a resolution uh, that was item number four. It was uh, to accept additional uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds. We're going to have a special meeting of the board, uh, the Finance and uh, Budget Committee to discuss that and approve a resolution authorizing uh, Director Rex to accept funds of approximately $300,000 from the uh, Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing uh, to Director Baker, uh, on my screen, you are frozen. Is he frozen on everyone else's screen? Uh, Jeff, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. But, uh, oh, there you go. There okay. you go. Sorry. Uh, go back about 15, 20 seconds. Okay, sounds good. We did approve that resolution um, authorizing uh, approximately $300,000 from uh, HICPUF for the uh, community options program as recommended by uh, Director Jayla Sanchez Warren. The other um, discussion and approval we had was a resolution authorizing Director Rex to negotiate and execute a contract with Hill Avium to provide professional uh, advertising and promotional services for our Way to Go program, um, not to, to exceed $860,000. So that was presented by Director Steve Erickson and approved. We had one informational item, uh, Mr. Chair. It was about a successful application for a grant from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to help us with data collection on crash data. And uh, that was informational. We'll be hearing more about that grant as more details become available. And that concludes my report. Excellent. Thank you very much. I know virtually on the Zoom platform, sometimes screens freeze like that. And it's a little bit awkward. Uh, yes. If that ever happens in a live meeting, though, I'll have more serious questions. <laughs> uh, the next up is a uh, report from our executive director, Doug Rex. Doug, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And good evening, everybody. Um, once again, I want to thank you, first of all, for your flexibility as we ride this COVID roller coaster. Um, you know, we're, we're meeting virtually again this evening, but uh, myself and the executive committee, we're, we're continuing to meet and discuss this. And hopefully next month, be, uh, we'll be in better shape to meet in person. So looking forward to meeting you all, especially the new members. I see um, Mayor Lighty there. I'm looking forward to meeting you, Mayor. And as well as everybody else. I, I just see you on my screen. I don't mean that. <laughs> so um, let me see here. So first of all, I want to talk about uh, Bike to Work Day. We had a successful event this year. We returned to our normal timing on our summer calendars for Wednesday, June 22nd. And um, we're pleased to report some of the results that we have thus far. So we we, uh, we believe we had almost 19,000 uh, people have participated across the region. And while this is certainly down from our pre-pandemic numbers, um, um, you know, we, and we know that, you know, there's still a lot of folks that are, that are working uh, remotely, including roughly about 50% of downtown workers. So, uh, so this is definitely a good turnout. We're really, really encouraged by, by, the, uh, by the numbers we received this year. 30% of those riders were first time participants. So in a single day, we were able to introduce, you know, about 6,000 or so uh, people to bike commuting. And uh, we'll be doing a follow-up survey to determine how, how many continue to bike after, after the event. Um, 
We had 319 companies participate in the business challenge this year. Uh, that's, that's tremendous. And the winners included Micron Technologies out of Longmont, uh, Davis Partnership Architects um, out of Denver, Specialized Boulder Experiences out of Boulder. Um, in the small business category, 26 to 50, uh, we had uh, La Sportiva um, Clothing and Footwear out of Boulder. And in the extra small uh, uh, business category, one to 25, Revelstoke Capital Partners out of Denver. So those, the, so. If, uh, if you have an opportunity to know anybody associated with those businesses, congratulate them. But also I wanna give a big shout out to, uh, to Nisha Moksha Gundam um, and the whole Way to Go team for, uh, for organizing the event. And we'll see you in the winter at Bike to Work Day in February. February weather sounds actually kind of good right now. Uh, actually, I'm kidding. I'm a warm weather guy, I ain't gonna lie. I grew up in Canada, I got enough of that cold growing up. Um, vaccine awareness campaign. Um, listen, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, COVID, COVID refuses to let us be, and this is really just a, a public service announcement. Um, as most of you know, COVID numbers, you know, with the new variants are a concern, and they're particularly a concern with, uh, with our older adults. Um, our area agency on aging has, has teamed up with uh, C4A, which is the Colorado Association of Area Agencies on aging to launch a vaccine awareness campaign specifically targeted at older adults, of course. So um, please encourage any older adult that you know to stay current with their COVID vaccinations and including the boosters. Um, also, I wanna note that uh, we have our upcoming, um, we will be soliciting applications for our upcoming fall session of our Civic Academy. Uh, it's gonna be start on, on uh, September 20th, which is my birthday, by the way. Still got lots of time to make note of that. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for you, or in particular, someone you know, it could be a constituent who you think could benefit from learning more about the important regional issues like transportation, economic vitality, sustainability, and uh, to build just civic capacity and relationships. It's a great event. It's like seven week event. We meet one night a week. And uh, I think we've had a lot of success and we're very proud of. Uh, of uh, the folks that have participated and, and, the, and the event itself. Um, so we're planning on opening up the, the application process in the coming weeks. So if you have questions or um, just like the, you know, tickle the brains of either uh, Steve Erickson or Sheila Lynch about this concept, please reach out and uh, they'll be happy to, to address any of your questions. The last thing I wanted to mention is on last Thursday, uh, Dr. Cog hosted 25 emerging leaders from all over Africa to learn more about regional governance and uh, programs that Dr. Cog administers on behalf of local governments in our region, of course. It's, uh, it was part of a, of a program called the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program. And uh, it was an absolutely wonderful event. I was able to, 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 to check in periodically and I would like to big shout out to uh, Director Ashley Stolzman and alternates Junie Joseph and Don Cameron um, who participated in this event on behalf of the board. I wanna thank you so very, very much, much appreciated. I think it, it really helped um, in explaining, it was nice having like locally elected officials there to be able to provide that just that extra flair and understanding of, uh, of regional issues from, from the elected uh, uh, participants perspective. Um, and it was, it was absolutely wonderful. I, it, it was so wonderful here, just the stories of these young leaders and the resilience they have to make this world a better place. They were, they were unbelievable. Um, a couple of folks on our staff, Jayla Sanchez Warren, our, our AAA director, um, she described the event to me as one of the best things she's ever, she's participated in in years. So that was very, very nice. And Ron Pabstorf, our transportation director, talked about how humbling the experience was, just learning about some of the conditions in which these, these the individuals grew up in and what they've been able to accomplish. So I'm so proud of, uh, of their, 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 uh, their attentiveness to our conversations. And, um, and yeah, we look forward to doing more of that in the future. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, worth noting that we've been the uh, focus of a lot of international visits recently. We had the Iraqi group coming through with uh, Joe Rice uh, through Dr. Cog offices and over at the city and county building, I greeted a group uh, from Mongolia uh, that was touring Denver. And so it's very good to hear about the, the uh, uh, Mandela Washington group as well. Uh, Doug, feel free to drop into the chat a link to your birthday registry 
uh, if you care to do so. I, I assume, Will do, sir. Thank you. I assume that was why you dropped the hint. <laughs> Much appreciated. Next item up on the agenda is public comment. We allocate up to 45 minutes at this point in the meeting for public comment, and each speaker has three minutes. Uh, if there are more speakers than 45 minutes will allow, we will then uh, move uh, to the uh, end of the meeting to complete public comment. Uh, Melinda, do we have folks, I see two in the attendees uh, who have raised their hands for public comment. Now I see four, now I see five. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> yes, and they may continue to roll in. <laughs> okay. um, yes, and uh, please, if you'd like to yeah, call please. on them, I will make sure they get unmuted. Okay, please promote them in the order that uh, their hands are, are up. Go ahead. Okay. Um, all right, it looks like first we have uh, Becky English. Um, I have unmuted you and uh, you should be able to speak. Welcome, Becky, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Becky English, Transportation Chair for the Colorado Sierra Club, which has more than 100,000 members and supporters here in our state. Uh, I just want to thank you for inviting this input. Uh, more than five years ago, I addressed this body to ask the board to be strategic about something, to not include the gargantuan Central 70 Highway Widening Project into the Transportation Implementation Program, excuse me, Improvement Program, uh, unless it could be proven beforehand that the project would not worsen the air for people in adjacent communities to breathe. We asked that state-of-art modeling uh, be done to get the uh, needed information. Uh, board members at the time, nevertheless, added the project to the tip, and the rest is history. In a related matter, I'm here tonight to urge you to bring a more strategic and integrated approach to transportation land use planning, such that, uh, trans uh, such that residents and businesses and our economy and environment at large will be better served. <clears throat> we would like to see you develop ways to not only approve bus rapid transit projects, for example, but also to make such approvals contingent upon associated transit-oriented development plans that include strong, affordable housing components. Uh, a lot of research shows that such development patterns benefit exactly those residents in our state who really do need a helping hand. And also, uh, there's a, a floating all boats um, effect as well. This is not meddling. This is very much part of your charge. It's well within your purview to influence outcomes that will benefit communities across the Front Range in ways that reach beyond business as usual. Dr. Cog has an opportunity now to provide the kind of strategic leadership called for in these challenging times. We need your thoughtful wisdom in a uh, time of critical housing shortages. And we believe that the intersection of land use policy and our housing crunch problem requires you to take uh, measures such as hosting housing stakeholder listening sessions. And, and actually all COGS should be doing this kind of work. Let's get Colorado's economy uh, moving by, uh, by modernizing our processes to produce superior results. Please encourage and require all your member governments, CDOT, Federal Highway Region 8, to integrate land use and affordable housing. Let's develop a real vision. Let's figure out a way to proceed with BRT and local shuttle projects and an electrically powered advanced skyway system on our major highway corridors that equitably serves all Colorado residents, visitors, and businesses while reducing BMT and advancing economic development and jobs. This board can develop and execute such a vision. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. English, appreciate it very much. Uh, Melinda, next. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, our next speaker is Heidi Leithwood. Uh, you are unmuted and should be able to speak. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Leithwood. Thank you, um, and hello, board members. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to speak today and for your work. I'm climate policy analyst with 350 Colorado. We're a grassroots organization of 20,000 with a mission to fight for a stable climate. I urge you to keep alive in your planning the context of the constantly accelerating climate crisis and the urgent need to redouble our efforts to reduce emissions. 
One great way to do this and at the same time improve our quality of life is to get people off the roads to reduce the BMTs. A safe and convenient multimodal transportation network is what we need to make this happen. And by rezoning to make good land use possible, we can create walkable neighborhoods and easy access to transit. Freeway projects should only be for the purpose of maintenance and safety. Widenings will only create increased demand. Like the line from Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Well, if you build bigger freeways, that's where they will come. To reduce VMTs, we need safe bike and ped infrastructure and convenient transit. Build that, and that's where they will come. Then we'll reduce our emissions. I want to share my personal experience with transportation. I've lived in Colorado for over 20 years, 18 of them in Denver. In 2018, I stopped driving except for emergencies. It's wonderful. I feel more connected to my community and healthier and happier. I get exercise just getting where I'm going by walking or biking to the transit, but it requires a major commitment. As I watch the hundreds of drivers that whiz their cars around me as I'm doing this, I realize many of them are unlikely to be able to make this commitment under our current conditions. I often find the biking and walking to be unsafe. And with so few people out on transit, especially at night, sometimes waiting at stops also feels unsafe. Many bus routes run only once or twice per hour. It would be much easier if they were every 15 minutes. To reduce VMTs, we need changes to the system to make it feel safe and convenient to walk, bike, and take transit. Some places I've tried to get to, like Commerce City, are virtually impossible without devoting two hours travel, which brings me to my next point. Commerce City and other environmental justice neighborhoods and freight corridors are harmed by the existing status quo of transportation in our state. We need projects that will be equitable for DI communities. They should reduce pollution in these communities, which are unjustly burdened, and they should create safe and convenient access to transportation for those communities. I can't emphasize enough how much we need to invest our millions, not in freeways, but in creating healthy and low emitting ways of getting around and land use that will support that as well. It will be worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Leithwood. Uh, Melinda, who is up next? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, our next speaker is Matt Cromer. Uh, you have been unmuted, Matt, and... Welcome, Mr. Cromer. Go ahead. All right. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Matt Cromer. I'm a Denver resident, and I work on transportation policy for the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP. I've been encouraged and inspired by the work of Dr. Cog's staff on the greenhouse gas rule. And I wanna commend your leadership on this complex and hugely beneficial policy. I'd also like to suggest that we think of the 2030 GHG reduction targets as a floor and not a ceiling. If we add these targets to even the rosiest of state electric vehicle projections, where we scale up from 60,000 EVs today to 1 million by 2030, we'll still be about 2.8 million metric tons or 25% short of the 2030 tar target. For this reason, RMI's Colorado analysis suggests we need to cut BMT per capita by 20% by 2030, far above the six or 7% BMT reduction listed in Dr. Cog's most recent GHG analysis. As a reminder, there are massive co-benefits to BMT reduction. And the GHG rule is expected to save Coloradans over $26 billion in net benefits by 2050 in the form of lower vehicle operating costs, fewer crashes, lower health care costs, and avoided damages from climate change. Benefits of the rule scale up in proportion to the level of VMT reduction. Second, I want to stress the importance of smart land use policies in achieving our climate targets. A recent national report from Up for Growth found that the US is roughly 4 million homes short of a stable housing market and focusing new growth in location efficient communities near jobs, transit, schools, and other opportunities could save as much as 200 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. That's the equivalent of phasing out the sale of gasoline vehicles in the US and going 100% electric for new sales by 2035. So huge, huge climate potential just from allowing and directing growth where it makes sense. Compared to detached single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, and multifamily homes can reduce vehicle travel by up to 40%, cut home energy use by up to 60%, and water consumption by up to 25%. 
Colorado is about 175,000 homes short of a stable market, at least partially a result of, a result of local, local zoning regulations that limit our ability to build a variety of housing types on less land and at lower price points. Supply is not meeting demand, both for residents who wanna move here in search of opportunity and for multi-generational Coloradans who wanna stay here and live near parents, kids, and grandkids. As a result, Colorado was recently listed as the ninth least affordable state. All this is just to say that Dr. Cog must take a larger role in land use and zoning. No single local government can solve climate or housing affordability on its own. For example, one city's efforts to provide affordable housing for all income levels are easily undermined by a neighboring community's efforts to restrict housing supply, which drives up regional housing costs. These are regional issues that require regional collaboration and we need to act together to solve both the housing and climate crises. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Much appreciated. Um, Melinda, next. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Our next speaker will be Randall. Randall, I will allow you. I'm right here. Welcome, uh, Mr. Loeb. Uh, um, good speak. evening, everyone. Do we start? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, those were in very intelligent, thoughtful remarks. Um, I was impressed. I usually I'm not around to hear them, but um, there's an organization that I've worked for through the COVID uh, pandemic, and that is Bayout Enterprises. And we're doing an event in Lakewood at the Heritage Center on the 10th of September uh, from 11 to um, 6. And I told my dear friend and colleague, Tammy Bellafato, I would mention it. Uh, but that's not really what I'm interested in right this second. Uh, Work is incredible because of social connections. I work with the Environmental Protection Agency in a Source America contract, uh, and I've been learning a lot about this. And I listened to the presentation of what it is that has blocked our being able to meet the standards of the world. We're the second um, most user um, of carbon um, type of products in the world. Uh, I'm trying to get myself an e-bike. I ride a bicycle every day and I've changed my life completely. Being in my 70s, I've had to streamline everything. But it seems to me that we need to be more aggressive in working um, against the stream of the, the values that we really don't have anything to worry about when of course out there, it's incredibly hot and it doesn't need to be burning up our world like Nero in Rome. I think we have to be more creative as I've said many times in the social connections. And it was very much more accurately addressed by the last three people. So I really don't have to do anything, but I work on the transit um, projections and I work on various things to help mitigate the nonsense that we're not all involved together. And we need to think that way. We need to think as partners, regardless of our social situation or whatever, wherever we come from. And so I really appreciate being able to um, be in person with you one of these days since I'm three blocks away at Aloft. And uh, thank you for your attention to this. Uh, and you have a good night. And, Stay cool. Thank you, Mr. Lowe. Very much appreciate those remarks. Uh, Melinda, we have one more speaker. Yes, we do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, our next speaker is Rachel Fultine of Bicycle Colorado. I will unmute you now. Welcome, uh, Ms. Fultine. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Rachel Fultine. And tonight uh, I am bringing uh, my head and my heart and my voice. Um, my head really has followed this in my role as the Director of Sustainable Transportation for Bicycle Colorado. Um, my, my heart has followed this as the mother of a teenage son. And um, my voice tonight though, I'm speaking in my role as the Mayor Pro Tem of the city of Wheat Ridge. Um, as the Mayor Pro Tem, like so many of you, I serve my community to, to help solve the problems that, that are real today, but that also we know are coming quickly. 
And sometimes as elected officials, we might see those before our constituents do. And the greenhouse gas rule has really afforded an opportunity for agencies, including Dr. Cog and CDOT and North Front Range to get together and use their collective creativity to try and solve the problem of how do we reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. And in that process, what we've learned is that the definition is really through transportation emissions, but the solution is really looking across all opportunities, including efficient land use. In Wheat Ridge, what I hear from my constituents is that they want to be able to safely walk to the park. They want their kids to ride their bike to school, and they wanna be able to safely cross the streets that they need to cross to access the great amenities that Wheat Ridge has to offer. Um, we're really excited about the solutions that are coming forward. The framework that this particular approach provides regionally really allows local jurisdictions to come up with the solutions that are gonna best serve them. Um, I just wanna give a lot of hats off to Dr. Cog's staff, the various committees and the boards for their creativity in really leaning into the solutions. I think we've all learned a lot more about ourselves and we've also learned more about the interdependency of transportation and land use. And I think what I've witnessed in my own community is we remove barriers to access to alternatives to driving a car, people take advantage of them. Since the, uh, the e-bike revolution of the last couple of years, I will say I see almost more e-bikes in Wheat Ridge than I do regular bikes. And it's because e-bikes are more accessible and they're a great option for people. So tonight, I just wanna say I firmly support um, everything Dr. Cog can do, including land use, um, to comply with the greenhouse gas rule. And one of my favorite quotes is, we never want to fail from a lack of creativity. And the creativity that's been brought forth in combination with mad modeling skills is really going to get us where we need to be to solve the problems that we know we have today. But even more importantly, the problems we know that the future generations are inheriting tomorrow. And that's not a legacy that I care to bring to my community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lutine. Much appreciated. Uh, that concludes our public comment right around 15 minutes. So thank you to all of our speakers for uh, turning out tonight. The next item on our agenda is our consent agenda, item seven. Uh, before I uh, ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda, may I call on uh, Director Stolzman, uh, who has notified us she wishes to remove one of the items uh, from the consent agenda. Thank Director you, Mr. Stolzman. Go ahead. I apologize for interrupting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to request um, that we remove item two from the consent agenda, the FY 2022 to 2025 Transportation Improvement Program TIP Policy Amendments Attachment B from the consent agenda so we can have a discussion about it um, on the regular agenda. Certainly, and we will do that. Uh, we will move that to uh, the action items that will then become the uh, last, the second uh, action item to, uh, tonight. So the consent agenda now consists of simply the minutes of June 15th meeting. I'd like to ask uh, who would like to make a motion that we approve those. Uh, Director Baker makes the motion. Yes. And uh, Director Starker seconds. Uh, right. Director Keel is late again with the second. <laughs> He's got to hit the button faster. Uh, all in favor of uh, approving the uh, consent agenda, which consists only of the minutes of the last meeting, please unmute and say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Please unmute and say no. Hearing none, are there any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, the uh, minutes of June 15th are unanimously approved. Now we move on to our action items. Uh, discussion of fiscal year 2021 TIP funded projects, second year delays. And uh, Todd Cottrell is, uh, Cottrell, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm used to the, the old clothing store, Cottrell. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, so this item pertains to TIP projects with FY21 funding that were delayed for a first time at the end of FY21, um, in which you took action on this in January and continue to be delayed as of July 1st. Um, so the projects included within this memo are now considered second year delayed. Um, as outlined within the TIP policy, um, if the second year delay is determined to be caused by the project sponsor itself, then the remaining unreimbursed funding for that delayed phase is returned back to Dr. Cog 
for reprogramming. Uh, the sponsor may still continue with the project, but uh, the Dr. Cog allocated funds for that delayed phase will not be available. Uh, the po policy continues to state that if, it, if it's determined that the delay is the fault of another agency, uh, such as maybe CDOT, RTD, maybe a railroad, railroad company or a utility company, or an outside factor. Uh, so recently it's been COVID-19, or perhaps it could be such as a natural disaster, a change in law or some sort of practice. Um, also what we've seen this year is a large inflation increases. Um, that future course of action and or penalty is to be determined by the board. So your action may range anywhere from the loss of funding for that delayed phase to an extension of time uh, so the sponsor can initiate that delayed phase. Um, so given that, uh, Dr. Cox staff has reviewed the status of all the project phases that received a first year delay um, last year for FY21. And after confirming their status, um, it has been determined that five projects continue to have uh, a delayed project phase that were not initiated by July, uh, July 1st. Um, so those five projects that received a second year delay include um, a project by CDOT Region 1, which is the I-25 and Alameda Operational Improvements. Uh, CDOT states that earlier delays in the IGA process with Denver, um, the need to update older pre-construction plans, um, and the need to secure additional funding due to inflation are those primary reasons why this project was not advertised by July 1st. Um, currently, CDOT is working to secure the additional funding and anticipates to advertise in late September. Uh, so the staff recommendation is to allow the project to continue with advertisement taking no place later than September. Um, the next two projects are both sponsored by the city and county of Denver. Um, the first is ITS device performance and reliability improvements. Um, just for your information, this was a, a project that came out of our regional transportation operations and technology set aside. Um, so Denver states the reasons for the continued delay include that the required clearances for this project to advertise um, simply just took longer because of the, the uh, project limits for it are citywide, um, coupled with early on IGA uh, development delays. Um, Denver did receive federal highway authorization to advertise this project back on July, uh, I'm sorry, June 29th. Um, so Denver is currently working through their internal process to advertise and anticipates doing so no later than August 5th. Uh, so again, the staff recommendation is to allow this project uh, to continue. Um, the second project that was delayed for a second year sponsored by Denver is Mobility Choice Network. And again, this was another set aside um, project that was selected out of our Community Mobility Planning and Implementation or CMPI set aside. Um, they state the reasons for that continued delay um, include CDOT clearances, um, a partner jurisdiction withdrew from the project causing additional delays. And then again, also early on IGA delays that took place. Um, and we actually just received uh, updated information this afternoon uh, that Denver has received their concurrence to advertise with federal highway from federal highway um, and anticipates advertising in that early to mid August timeframe. And again, the staff recommendation would be to allow this project con to continue. The fourth delayed project is sponsored by the town of Netherland uh, for downtown ADA sidewalk connections. Uh, so Netherland states that the ex uh, really Excel Energy continues to delay the implementation of this project um, due to early on a lack of cost estimates and just general time delays to be able to relocate, a, uh, relocate utilities. Um, they've also had the loss of key staff and supply chain delays in acquiring EV chargers. Um, both Netherland and CDOT are currently going through the final project reviews and anticipate being able to advertise uh, either late this year or early on in 2023. Um, so again, the recommendation would be to allow this project to continue um, with advertisement no later than January of next year. Uh, the final project is sponsored by um, town of Parker, um, the traffic response signal control. Um, and they state that staff changes and supply chain slowdowns were key to the delays within this project. Uh, at the current time, CDOT is reviewing the design plans and advertisement is anticipated for later this year in December. And so again, we conclude with a staff recommendation that we allow this project to continue uh, with advertisement no later than December. 
Um, so just to wrap things up, your agenda packet does include a letter on each project outlining the uh, additional information, um, if you so choose to take a look at that. Um, and then also, if you, um, you know, unless you have any further questions, um, either myself uh, hopefully can answer those, or there also are representative from each of the project sponsors um, on tonight's call um, to help answer those as well. Um, if not, the motion before you is to approve the staff recommendation to continue each project and establishing deadlines for each sponsor's project. Um, with that, Mr. Cherry, happy to take any qu questions or comments. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I would like to call on my uh, co-director from Denver, Nick Williams. Uh, uh, we were, he notified me this afternoon, and I let, uh, I let you all know about the uh, concurrence we got. Uh, Nick, would you offer just a brief explanation on that uh, Mobility Choice Network project? Yes, no, we are, uh, as I think Todd said there, got our concurrence here uh, and very, very confident um, about being able to meet our deadline here in early August. Uh, so very excited about that. And I will just touch on two others real quick. Um, uh, I think we talked about the uh, ITS project that is moving forward and wanted to on the, the CDOT project request just mention we are working closely uh, right now with uh, CDOT this is an important project for for City and County of Denver as well, uh, and are confident we will be able to work through and, and fill that project gap. So happy to answer questions on any of these, but but yeah, very confident certainly on the two Denver uh, uh, advertised projects that we will be good to go well before the deadline. Thank you, uh, uh, Director Williams. Uh, any other directors have questions for Todd or for any other the, any of the project sponsors on their projects? I see none, uh, so I will assume there are none. Uh, let me ask if any member would like to offer the proposed motion that is on the screen. Director Williams. Move to approve the staff recommendation to continue each project and establishing deadline for each sponsor's project. Thank you, Director Shaw. I second. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Harrison, oh, I'm sorry, uh, did you have a comment or you just, okay. Uh, do we have any comments or questions yeah. on the motion? Uh, Director Daigle, no, okay. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, let me call for the vote. All those in favor of this motion to approve the staff, rec staff recommendation, uh, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any opposed, please unmute and say no. Hearing none, uh, are there any abstentions? Please unmute and say abstain. Hearing none, this, uh, this action item then is, um, is approved. Thank you very much, Todd, I appreciate that. Thank Let's you, Mr. go Sir. now to the item, and I gotta move my agenda around here on my other screen to get to uh, uh, the uh, former consent item, uh, which is now our action item. Uh, fiscal year 2022-2025, TIP policy amendments. Uh, do we have a staff report on that? I know this was on the consent uh, agenda, so I, I hope that we have staff available to uh, maybe, uh, Doug, give a brief uh, explanation on this. And we'd also have David Beckhouse from FTA here who can answer questions from uh, the FTA's perspective. Mr. Chairman, yes, Josh Schwank should be available. Great. Yes, Mr. Chair, I can give that presentation. All right, Josh, go ahead. And, and let me be clear, uh, uh, Director Stoltzman, you are interested in discussing the new project, Boulder County Transit Operating Assistance. Uh, let me ask first, is there any question on the other four? Uh, because at the end, I think I'd like to separate these two and do the four in a block and then maybe consider the Boulder one separately. Does anybody have any questions on any of the projects other than the Boulder County? Please raise your hand. I see none. So let's concentrate now just on the Boulder County Transit Operating Assistance. Director Stolzman, let me give you the floor. I'm sorry, Josh, you have the floor. Then we'll go to Director Stolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, specifically on the Boulder County project, this would be adding a new project to the Transportation Improvement Program sponsored by Boulder County. Uh, it would be $34,241,000 in Federal American Rescue Plan Act COVID relief funding that is dedicated to transit operating assistance within the small urbanized areas in Boulder County. Um, 
There is additional information from the county uh, provided in the form of a couple letters that are attached to your agenda packet, as well as the program of projects, which specifically outlines which uh, routes the county intends to uh, use the funding to support. Um, so with that, I do believe we have, um, as you mentioned, a representative from FTA and I believe representatives from the county on the call who can help answer questions, um, but I can also uh, assist with any questions that there may be as well. Excellent. Okay, let me go to Director Stolzman as the director who called this out. I will give you the floor first. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and um, directors. So. Um, Folks might remember um, back in the fall of last year, um, there were several newspaper articles around this um, COVID related funding to restore transit service in our region. And, um, you know, historically in our area, um, the transit money from the FTA has gone to our transit agency, RTD, because they're set up and can receive the transit funds and provide us transit service. But it's not required to be that way. These, these small urbanized areas, my understanding is that the governor has. Um, the ability to direct the funds to a, a recipient agency that is able to take them. Um, and so you might recall from last fall, there were several news articles around this topic. Um, RTD directors did opinions in the Denver Post um, around whether this was equitable or not. And, um, you know, there were point counterpoint back and forth on all of this. And in the end, the funds um, well, so let me just say that Director Liu um, did indicate in a letter at one point to RTD um, that it was really critical to use the $34 million of um, COVID recovery funds to restore service to the FF2, the FF4, and the LX. Um, those routes were specifically called out and, the, and, um, and asked RTD, please indicate that you can restore these critical BRT routes that are so important to GHG emission reduction, among other things. Um, and RTD said, you know, we really cannot commit to that because we have these driver shortages and we have Title VI issues. So um, that really got me digging into it more to try to understand what the issue is, because these funds actually come from step three different small urbanized areas that are identified in the census block, and one of them being Louisville, uh, Lafayette, Erie. Um, there are other funds associated with Longmont and also with Boulder. Um, so I was trying to understand the director's different perspectives from RTD, and I think that some people raised some really valid concerns that when RTD was looking at COVID, they really wanted to focus on service that was to people who had no ability to get to work on anything other than transit, because ridership was so down from the choice, what they call the choice riders, people who choose to ride rather than people that must ride. And I think there were some really valid points raised and RTD directors had tried really hard in a really challenging time um, to make sure that people that were identified as essential workers and had no other choice but to take transit to work had that service. And so in their restoration of service, they were really focused on um, bringing it back in a way that met their Title VI requirements and was equitable and ensured um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really was very inclusive. So while um, you know I'm in full support of getting the FF2 and FF4 and LX back, and I've been working really hard with um, Lynn, my representative on RTD, to try to figure out how to do that, I saw this move that the, that the governor indicated over being sort of a confrontational way of approaching it. And I, I really think we need to work together to solve this problem. But nonetheless, um, the governor assigned the funds to Boulder County to restore those services. So now fast forward to today, um, and, and my understanding is that in order for a county to receive these services, FTA has to ensure that, you know, they can receive the funds, that they've done their Title VI plan, that, um, you know, the community has had a chance for input, all the things that are required of someone who's to receive these federal funds to make sure that they meet the federal obligation. It's also my understanding that these funds are for restoring transit service that was cut during COVID. So now the funds have been uh, reallocated and um, I had expected to see or hear in the packet when this came forward or have a conversation at some point in time about how this would restore that FF2, FF4 and LX since that was what this whole thing was about. And that was why the funding was reallocated. So I was surprised to see in the packet that those routes are not being proposed to be restored in this program programming. 
So that raises a number of questions and concerns for me. Um, I, I guess at the very minimum, there's an error in the packet that I would like to be corrected for the record that identifies Louisville as supporting this proposal because we haven't taken action to support this proposal. So at very minimum, I would like the record corrected. Um, but beyond that, I think it's important that we understand how the Title VI concerns um, and requirements of FTEA are being met by the new recipient of funds, um, how we plan to restore service in the area to those critical routes, the FF2, the FF4, and the LX that were promised when these funds were reallocated. I think we need to understand more um, on the grant administration side about how um, these funds are meeting the spirit and the letter of the regulation for the COVID related funds that they're for. I think it's also important that we understand um, the reporting responsibility and whether this meets all of FTA's requirements for the grant administration. Um, it's my understanding as a mayor that represents one of the small urbanized areas that my community would be included in the conversation at bare minimum from a Title VI standpoint. Um, and I just don't feel that there's been a public process around this that has been inclusive um, of the communities that the money is supposed to be serving. And so I would like to continue this portion of the item so we can have further conversation and get answers to those questions and include the communities um, that this service will be provided to in the discussion. Thank you, uh, Director. Uh, before I go to Director Leva, I just wanna point out that uh, uh, your request to correct the record, I would have to uh, refer to Boulder County's transportation planning because the reference to Louisville su supporting this was not a Dr. Cog declaration, but actually came from uh, came from the Boulder County Transportation uh, Department. So if if they would like to uh, amend that or at least speak to it during the meeting here, I think Kathleen Bracky Break Bracky, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, may be here. Uh, but uh, Director Levy, you may want to shed light on this. So let me give the floor to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I, I do welcome the opportunity to address this since um, since this is a, a project that Boulder County has put forward. Um, I just want to, um, I think, provide a little bit more context for what we're doing here today, which is amending the TIP so that these funds can be programmed. Um, I, it's my, not my understanding that we are not here to decide whether um, the governor made the right decision in directing these funds to Boulder County um, or the FTA is making the right decision in processing our request to be a direct recipient. And those seem to be the issues that um, Director Stolzman takes issue with. Um, for these particular funds, which are the ARPA funds, um, we submitted a letter jointly, uh, Boulder County in conjunction with RTD to um, Shoshana Liu, the director of RTD, which is uh, the entity to which uh, Governor Polis delegated uh, the authority to make decisions about these funds. Uh, it was a joint letter requesting that these funds um, be directed to Boulder County uh, to program for the small urbanized areas within Boulder County. And so that is the basis on which we have proceeded. Um, and I don't think this body um, has the power to undo that, um, that direction. Uh, we're proceeding through the process of becoming a direct recipient. Um, Mayor Stolzman or Director Stolzman's um, email to all of us stating her objections and her concerns uh, indicates a number of areas that we are proceeding through um, in order uh, in close consultation with the FTA concerning what the requirements are. So, uh, and to date, we feel that we're working well through that process. We haven't received any concerns about our ability to become a direct recipient. Uh, we um, feel, and I, I think uh, the FTA concurs, that the program of projects that we have submitted are within the areas that uh, these ARPA funds were designated for. They are to restore important services. Um, VIA Mobility will be uh, contracted to provide um, some of these services. Some of them are already being provided by um, by uh, RTD, uh, the HOP is one of them that is a joint community 
project uh, with City of Boulder and RTD. We've got the uh, service from Boulder to Lyons, um, you know, a number of routes, the Ride Free Lafayette, uh, ADA uh, on-demand rides uh, that VIA will be providing. So, um, you know, when we are in the process of doing the Title VI analysis, it's a very different analysis for a uh, community that's, that is the size of these small urbanized areas. Um, but we're, we're confident that we will um, be accepted as a direct recipient. Um, but more importantly, I just think it's, it's important to put um, into context what it is that Dr. Cog is um, authorized to do in conjunction with these funds. Um, yes, we do need a TIP amendment in order to program these funds, but um, I, I don't think Dr. Cog can reverse the decision of the governor to uh, award these funds to Boulder County or, um, you know, tell the FTA not to accept us as a recipient. So I, you know, this is, this is where I'm just a little bit baffled about by, you know, what what conversation we would be having here. Uh, RTD had indicated that, that with these funds, they could not restore the services that were requested to be restored and that they would not restore them. Now, we're, we can't do that. Boulder County can't do that. Um, it, and and um, $34 million in one-time funding isn't sufficient to do that. Uh, and because these are designated small UZA funds, we need to use them to benefit those UZAs, which I think if you, know, if you look at the program of projects, um, those projects very much do. Um, RT, RTD had indicated that um, they would simply um, put these, these funds into their budget, their overall budget, and they would, they would be mixed with all their other general funds um, and uh, ARPA funds and um, weren't going to be specifically allocated for services in these areas. So, you know, that's, that's my overall response. Um, I, I can address the, the separate points that are made um, in Director Stolzman's email, but, um, but I, I don't think they're really pertinent to our conversation here, other than, I mean, I, as I indicated before, you know, the concerns about the FTA reporting requirements um, and uh, whether, uh, whether Boulder County as the grantee has the financial and technical capacity. Um, we're, we're in the process of receiving that assurance from or getting that approval from FTA. And I, and I am very confident that we'll get that. Thank you, Director Levy. Uh, Director Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, as a representative, obviously, for the town of Erie, we support what Boulder County is trying to do, and Director Levy has, has discussed. I think, I, as much as Director Stoltzman, your concerns in regards to trying to restore those routes, I think are definitely important because they're definitely important routes that have, um, have gone by the wayside during COVID. And if there is a vehicle and a way to get those back, that would be ideal. But this is I think for what we're trying to accomplish here with these funds, um, that's probably not the best vehicle to do so. But, um, but I do support in terms of overall trying to restore those routes with RTD, but that's a different way. To, we have to go to a different strategy. Um, but as town of Erie, obviously we're about the lack of RTD uh, that is here in, in town. And, and I think that from the funding perspective, whatever money does come into RTD, they are gonna allocate it to different areas and maybe not so, and we lose that control, I think with this particular sort of vehicle that we have available to us. And so as, uh, as representative of the town of Erie, we wanna kind of move forward with, with uh, what uh, Director Levy is talking about. Thank you. Uh, Director Stolzman, go ahead. Thank you, sorry for speaking twice. I just wanna to respond to some of the comments about my comments and just clarify some things. So, um, you know, listening to Director Levy's concerns um, saying that RTD would simply put it in the budget. The issue with that is that because 
this money has been supplanted from RT that could have restored service across the board. When they made their plan, they thought of us as a region. And now we're picking off certain pools of funding from them. And so they are coming to our communities asking for further cuts because now they have less funding coming from the area. And if I was in Denver, the Denver Aurora urbanized area, I would be looking right over here saying, wait a minute, like they're asking for no reduction in service from when the plan was made holistically looking at all the funds and now they're taking money out and adding service. So if I was in the rest of the region, I would be furious about it. Um, and, and I understand why RTD is asking us for further cuts. And, and so when I look at this, this does not seem like a regional approach. I'm really concerned about what this does for low income riders across the district and the precedent that this sets, um, picking areas off and then allocate just, trying to look at a uh, Title VI plan for a specific area because you don't like the answer when we look at the region as a whole, I think makes a region of haves and have nots. And I think there are some serious equity issues with that that, that bring a lot of concern to my soul. <laughs> so I have to bring those forward today. Um, and just, you know, we talk a lot about um, reducing BMT and the importance of BRT and things like that. And I just don't see how the actions that we're taking align with our equity goals and align with our um, VMT reduction goal. So I'm really concerned about those two things. I tried really hard to make an ask that wasn't exactly what I wanted to ask for, but I thought it was pretty reasonable, which is to have a conversation about this because we have not been included in the process. And I'm the mayor of one of the areas that is the urbanized, small urbanized area census block that this funding represents. So I asked if we could continue this so we could have a conversation about how to move forward. And I heard basically back that that's not you know, what we're here to discuss and that's outside of the purview. I also heard, you know, it's not within our purview as Dr. Cog to discuss this. So I guess I, I would just say if this isn't within our purview, I would change my request of the board to just request that we table this indefinitely. If there's nothing for us to discuss and community members can't ask to have a conversation about transit funding in their area offline and delay the decision until that's happened, I would just say, I'm not exactly sure what we're here talking about. Thank you. Director Shaw. Thank you. I I just had more of a clarifying question. It says that uh, that the the aim is to um, accept maybe five hundred ninety two thousand dollars on behalf of Longmont, Louisville, and Erie. And although I don't know the routes, are is there an approximate distribution of these funds that's being made to um, um, to use the funds in the area that they're being accepted for? I I guess I'm just curious, or if that plays into the discussion. I apologize because I really don't know the routes enough to to know. You can answer that. And did that mean uh, uh, Longmont or should that have been Lafayette? Is that a typo in the uh, packet? Uh, I, I was scratching my head over that. Uh, who can respond to that? Director Levy, can you? Yeah, thank, thank you, um, Chair Flynn. Um, I, I think I can respond to that. Um, and so um, it's, it's $34,240,968. <laughs> um, not quite as much as 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 you said but uh, the, but the um included in the packet there was an explanation of the um the areas that um that the program of projects um proposes to restore services to and they are very much local and they very much are intended to serve um, the the small urbanized areas that are that we're discussing here, and just for clarification, there in fact there are actually three. Um, there is the city of Boulder, which and these are formula allocation numbers, um, but and they're based on census tracts, and in some instances, the census tract doesn't exactly track with the with municipal boundaries, but roughly speaking. Um, the city of Boulder, 32 million, um, the city of Longmont, 1.3 million, and then a combined UZA that is Louisville, Longmont, Erie, and then um, 
this one of the census tracts does actually include a little bit of the town of Superior, and that's 592,000. So, um, so it's it's portions of um, the Plains areas of Boulder County. Um, the Hop is a circulator route within the city of Boulder. Um, it it serves the student population. It serves downtown. It serves the major shopping areas in the eastern part of the city. Um, there's a, a, a new service. Um, it's actually a restoration of a service. Um, it's been newly renamed the Lions Flyer that would go between City of Boulder and Lions, which is a small community uh, directly north of Boulder. Um, also included in the program of projects is uh, the Jump, which um, has been really foreshortened and that um, uh, did serve the town of Erie. And, um, and that's been cut so that they are not served. We would like to restore that. The Bolt, which is um, the current service that runs between Boulder and Longmont uh, on the diagonal highway, um, the LDI and the L or LD1 and the LD2, which uh, run from Longmont on Highway 287 um, down to Broomfield. So, and, and then also service between Boulder and Netherlands. So these are all very much local services that are intended to serve the populations within the UCA that's designated. Does that answer your question, Director Shaw? I, I guess, so my question is whether or not there would be services restored to to these three areas, Louisville, Longmont, and Erie, that would equal roughly $592,000. I, I, I'm just trying to, I guess, understand that part. I, oh, I'm I, sorry, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, I don't know that the dollar for dollar does. Um, I, there's, um, Lafayette has a service that called Ride Free, Ride Free Lafayette, which these funds would support. Um, there's a ADA paratransit service. It's, it's basically on demand, call on demand. Um, so it, it serves those communities um, all together. The, the, uh, I don't believe the jump goes through uh, Louisville um, per se. Thank you. Yeah. And and it doesn't it doesn't accomplish what Director Lou set out to do in the letter when she was reallocating these funds, which is restore the three routes that I've listed. Thank you, uh, Director Shaw. Is that all? Thank you, uh, Director Sorry, Spear. Yes. Director Spear, go ahead. Thank you. Make sure your credit um, is on track. I just yes. had a question. Being relatively new to. Uh, to this, and I think a lot of these discussions happened before um, I even got to Boulder City Council. Um, but my understanding was that this amendment was unanimously supported by the Dr. Cobb Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee. And I was just wondering if you could talk through, or someone on staff could talk through the process that this has already been through um, with Dr. Cog before getting to um, tonight. Uh, could, uh, could we have uh, maybe Josh uh, Schwenker talk to that? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Um, so as with all of our TIP amendments, they are taken to our Transportation Advisory Committee um, for initial review. Um, following that, they do, as you mentioned, go to our Regional Transportation Committee as well. Um, you are correct that um, both committees uh, voted uh, to approve all five amendments at their meetings um, in, a, in a unanimous vote. So. Um, it has now um, come to the board with the recommendation from both of those committees. Right, and um, just one question, because the one thing that, you know, there, there are times when new information comes to light, right, when it's helpful to reconsider decisions. Um, and I'm just wondering, because I don't, I don't think I'm quite understanding what new information has come to light since those decisions were made um, that might lead us to make a different decision here. I think uh, Director Stolzman, who is the one who brought this forward, uh, might want to respond to that. And I remind uh, remind you, Director, that uh, uh, David Beckhouse is here from FTA at, at your request. So if you wanted to uh, ask questions there also, 
Go ahead. Sure. At, at minimum, I think the new information is that the information in the packet that was presented at those two um, boards was inaccurate, stating that Louisville was in support of this and it's, you know, in part our urbanized area. So at minimum, the information presented to those boards was inaccurate. Uh, but I think that there are many things that those two groups didn't consider around equity um, and around the original intent when this funding was reallocated. And so, you know, I could, it, I'm surprised to not see the October 19th letter from Director Liu in the packet. Um, and I would be really interested in understanding what those two committees considerations of that information is. Um, and then just reiterating all I was originally asking for is a conversation so that we could come up with a path forward, which doesn't seem like that's a plan now. Um, I would, you know, I would be really interested in understanding if FTA feels like um, everything has been completed for these funds to be spent on these projects that are listed in our packet. Um, because my understanding is these are supposed to be funds that were allocated for res restoration of service that was cut during the pandemic. And it's not clear to me that that's what's being proposed. Um, uh, Director, before I go uh, to you, uh, let me ask if Mr. Beckhouse would have any information based on that question? If uh, still, sure. Go ahead. So, so we are still working on some of the technical uh, things with the city of county, uh, city of Boulder, um, on or county of Boulder. Sorry, um, prior to making the grant uh, award, uh, this is one of the items that right here that has to happen before that uh, before that application can be approved by FTA. Um, and there's a number of other uh, you know elements to that we're still working with with Boulder on. Um, I would just, um, you know, clarify, I think the intent of the federal funds is not just to restore service. It's really to keep transit agencies from falling off a fiscal cliff during the COVID uh, um, situation. So we had we had transit agencies that cut, you know, 50% of their service. Um, and without the federal funds from the CARES Act and the CRISA Act and the ARP money, it might've been 100% of the service and some of them might've gone out of business. So it is it is to you know keep transit agencies you know alive and as they were able to get uh, you know these in, in, uh, infusions of money from the federal government they were able to decide you know okay we're doing a little better let's let's go from fifty percent to seventy five percent or you know and and they're all making their own financial um, decisions about how how quick it makes sense to restore service. Um, at the same time, they're dealing with gas prices and labor shortages and things like that. So there's there's not a specific requirement that every grant for ARP funds be directly linked to restoring services. RTD uh, was able to draw down, was able to apply for all their ARP money for the Denver and Aurora urbanized area, and they've been spending that money. Um, and they, you know, they've restored a lot of their services, but not all of it. So. Um, you know, I know that that was a that kind of a big part of the local discussion about what routes uh, should be reinstituted um, that kind of led to some of these uh, changes and made Boulder a direct recipient. But um, I just wanted to give a little clarification about that. Thank you, Mr. Beckhouse. Mm -hmm. Much appreciated. Now, Thanks. Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And and I guess two two more points, two remaining points. Um. To, to the concern that we misrepresented um, the position of Louisville um, in, in our letter indicating that we were submitting this request in conjunction with um, the cities of Boulder, Longmont, Louisville, Lafayette, and the town of Erie. Um, I, I think we simply misunderstood here because we had been uh, working in conjunction with staff and keeping staff apprised, inviting them to meetings, um, had never received any objection or concern. And, um, you know, I, to my knowledge, no other city council had become involved uh, in, you know, making um, a formal decision to either approve or reject. And I, and I to my knowledge, I don't believe uh, Louisville City Council has taken a firm position, but, um, so if we overstated that, um, that's that's our mistake. But um, I, I also, when when Governor Polis and Director Liu 
made the decision to, to direct these funds to Boulder County, it was not so that we could restore the service that Director Liu had requested be restored. It was in recognition that these, serv these funds were not going to help with restoring these desperately needed services uh, between uh, Boulder County and the communities within Boulder County and, um, and the communities along those routes. It was so that they could be put to use to serve the local community, the small urbanized areas, which is how they are identified and designated. So it, I think there's a misunderstanding that because Director Liu said, um, you know, we expect you to restore these services, and if you're not, we're going to take the funds away, that they were then directed towards Boulder County, or we were given the opportunity to accept them. Um, for purposes of restoring those services. That was not what happened. Um, it was so that we could provide and plan with our local communities um, to restore the services within Boulder County that would serve the residents and the people who commute into Boulder County. Thank you. Uh, Director Mulvey, you're up. Hi, thank you. Hearing all of this makes me a little concerned because Although it doesn't affect my geographic area, we're all here to represent the whole region. And what I'm hearing is that it's supposed to be for a whole county and there's a municipality that's losing a bet, losing something it felt it should have gotten and it's not agreeing. And there should be a discussion when the votes by the entire board. And we have a letter that is not in the packet that seems to be pertinent to the issues. And with all this controversy and discussion back and forth, it seems fair to allow a little reflection by those of us who are really beginning to appreciate this for the first time. It just rings a little bit hard on the ear to hear that Governor Polis and, Dir and, and Director Liu made these decisions. And it may or may not be the case, but it's starting to sound like it. And, I, for one, would surely appreciate the opportunity to read Director Liu's letter and to reflect on what I'm hearing because it is quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Spear, you're up again. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify what I think I heard uh, Mr. Beckhouse say a few moments ago, that um, these funds are really intended to help out RTD as, as well, sort of to, <laughs> to keep services running um, elsewhere just by supporting some of their operations. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yes, RTD was able to, to draw down, you know, all the CARES funds, all the CRISA funds, and they're drawn down a large portion of the ARP funds. And, you know, they've been, as they as they've, been able to get that money. It's helped them stabilize their financial situation. It's helped them decide, like, you know, maybe we can start to reinstate state some services. And it's helped them kind of, and they're making, you know, calculations about how long that money is going to last, um, you know, um, and, and and what their financial situation may be when the when these uh, COVID relief funds run out. And so every every transit agency is making kind of a different calculation about how to, how to spend those funds, um, how quickly to reinstall state service, um, what services are doing better than others during you know current ridership patterns, and you know what their priorities should be. Um, and so um, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, they 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 they've been drawing down uh, the the other ARP funds and other previous. Uh, uh, COVID relief funds from FTA. Thank you. Um, and then just another question, just so that I have a sense of it. What are the consequences of um, kind of failing to move forward with this? I don't know if somebody on staff could answer that. I mean, is there, because I, I mean, with ARPA funds, right, isn't there a timeline that they have to be kind of used by? And so I'm just wondering what are the consequences? Because it sounds like there's a, uh, more steps after tonight um, that kind of need to happen for this to move forward. There are some deadlines in the ARP bill about when funds need to be obligated by and when they need to be spent by. Um, between the other, um, I'm, I'm sorry, between the other uh, COVID relief funds bills and all the new programs under the uh, BI, the 
uh, partisan infrastructure law. I don't have those at the at the my fingertips, but I do not believe that we're um, currently approaching any hard deadlines. Okay, thank you. Um, because I, and just sort of a, a comment rather than a question, I very much hear Mayor Stoltzman's concerns about um, equity, and I think my my question in this um, situation is is not necessarily um, how how do we kind of fix this at the 11th hour to address some of these concerns, but rather um, what can we change about the process to do things differently next time um, to make sure that we we are in a different place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Teal, uh, please, you're up. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Mayor Stoltzman for bringing this to our attention. I mean, um, a, a, a commonly accepted practice with use of consent calendar does imply, if not unanimity, it does imply uh, substantial consent, substantial uh, agreement. The fact that we have had uh, such a lengthy conversation on this uh, does imply that uh, it was appropriate for the mayor to take the action she did. Uh, secondly, um, it, there does seem to be a number of uh, open questions on this. And so uh, were a motion to be made by the mayor, Mayor Stoltzman, to, um, to make a motion to uh, continue this item, I would be supportive. And then thirdly, um, you know, I, I do definitely appreciate uh, Director Spears' concerns. Uh, the um, the uh, ARPA uh, deadlines are at the top of the mind for many of us, uh, perhaps um, those of us uh, at the county level, then at the municipal level, just because of the nature of the funds and this volume of the funds that was offered. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, Mr. Beckhouse is correct. We do have time to hash through some of these uh, we've got 20 till 2024 for substantial allocation. We have 2026 for project completion. So I think, uh, again, this is a very appropriate discussion. I appreciate hearing from Mayor Stoltzman on this matter. If a motion of continuance is made, I would be interested in uh, supporting that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director Teal. Uh, Director Rogan, you're up. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Director Teal's comments. And, you know, Lyon, the town of Lyons is thrilled to have the Lyons flyer back, really. And we also, uh, I don't think we're invited to be involved in the discussions about this funding. You know, I'm relatively new here at Dr. Cog, so I checked with staff, and staff didn't recognize the issue. So, um, I do think that it's worth taking another look at and taking our time with, particularly if there aren't going to be any consequences in terms of deadlines. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Director Peck, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think this is a good conversation, and I am uh, happy that Mayor Stoltzman brought this forward. Uh, it was my understanding when it was first brought up that the ARPA funds were going to be designated to RTD to restore these um, routes. And both in the uh, CDOT letter from Shoshana Lu, as well as uh, the governor's letter, it was, it was obvious that it was to restore the, the routes that Mayor Stoltzman has indicated. What is frustrating for me is that it, it seems like staff knows what is happening and going on going on with this, but then it comes to a group of elected officials at Dr. Cog to okay to approve what staff has put together. Um, and we don't have a way to discuss why it has changed, why the direction of, why, of how these funds are to be uh, allocated has changed. Um, and it is also frustrating to me that RTD has decided that they're not going to spend this money because it's not enough to keep the routes going. But if they're trying to build ridership, this should be the ridership that augments these routes uh, to keep them going. Um, it's, it feels as though we are working against what our vision is and what we really want to do. So um, I, I would also be interested in putting this, uh, well, 
in discussing this further at a future agenda and maybe having a, a more in-depth discussion about it. Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Director Shaw, you're muted, and Director Flynn, you were muted when you told him he was muted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Director Shaw, I'm not hearing you. I appreciate all the head shakes to let him know. So thank you. Still not hearing you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Levy, do you want to go ahead and maybe Director Shaw uh, will try you again? Yeah, maybe, he's maybe, probably maybe. probably having microphone connection problems. Thank you. Um, I you know I, I'm so surprised by the direction this conversation has gone. Um, uh, it was on the consent agenda because um, there wasn't any controversy that was anticipated, um, uh, and um, now we're we're. Uh, I, I, I'm just blown away. But so I, I want to be clear here. Um, there, there seems to now be an impression um, that the funds are being used for something that is inconsistent with what Director Liu intended the funds to be used for. That is not the case. Um, when RTD indicated that it would not use these funds to restore services on the Flatiron Flyer routes, then Director Liu, in conjunction with Governor Polis, um, requested that Boulder County apply for and, re and request these funds so that we could plan to restore service within Boulder County. These are funds designated for small urbanized areas. The, the Denver Aurora funds are, are for a large urbanized area. There is not the same opportunity with those funds as there is for small urbanized areas. Um, so there's been no bait and switch. We didn't take the money and then use it for something else. We used it for exactly what they are supposed to be used for, to serve the small urbanized areas. RTD got over $300 million in CARES Act funds. Um, they've gotten, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars to restore service. Uh, they have a $600 million cash um, account right now that they're sitting on. Um, we're trying to serve the people of Boulder County. Um, this is the, the means by which we will be able to fund the Lions Flyer. Um, so <laughs> that, that's, you know, without these funds, we can't do it. Um, Town of Lyons is not within a small urbanized area. Um, so they're not part of, the, part of the consultation process. I was gonna suggest that uh, we approve the TIP amendment so that we can program these funds and Boulder County will continue working with the communities within the UZAs to assure that the program, pro, program of projects that we have taken out to public comment reflects the needs within Boulder County. And so I, you know, I, that would be, I mean, I wouldn't change the motion. It would be to approve the TIP amendment um, and renewing the commitment to work with the communities within the small urbanized areas. Again, this, these funds, if, if the TIP amendment is not approved, and and we can have the FTA um, address this um, if if I'm mistaken, but it, it, the funds are not going to be returned back. You know they're not going to be returned, to, or I shouldn't even use those terms. They're not going to be um, uh, directed to RTD. Um, the the authority to make the decision about where small UCA funds go is up to the governor, and he has delegated that authority to Shoshana Liu, the director of CDOG.
Director Shah, do you want to uh, go again? I am still not hearing you. Still not hearing you. Uh, Director uh, Shah, you, if you log out and join the meeting again, that might help. Uh, let me call on uh, Mr. Beckhouse in the meantime. Hi, there's a, uh, I think a question to me. Uh, I, you're correct that the, we would uh, need an, another letter from uh, the governor uh, changing the governor's apportionment distribution if the funds were to be uh, awarded to RTD instead of uh, Boulder County. Um, that would that would be a that would there's a, there's steps that could be taken to 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 reverse that, but the the, the the governor's letter would have to be changed. Thank you. Struggling to find my unmute button, uh, Director Shaw. The suggestion has been made in the chat that uh, you can type your question in the chat or call in. Uh, Director Spear, go ahead. Thank you. Um, what is the uh, what is the alternative outcome that we could have here? Because it sounds like these funds are kind of they're they're designated to um, come into uh, the small UZAs, um, and I don't know if like can can we use those to um, fund more regional routes like the FF one and two and those kinds of things, or I guess what, what is the, what's the alternative that we're looking at? Uh, who can answer that? Mr. Beckhouse, Josh Schwenk, jump ball. Feel free to jump, uh, answer that question. FCA would rely on the local uh, and regional decision-making process to determine what what are the appropriate routes for for those funds. Um, and so, in in this case, would that that would be the county, Boulder County? Well, it's a multiple it's a multiple with, level with uh, process because the the, the uh, program projects does have to go to the to Dr. Cobb. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director Stolzman. Go ahead. I was just um, raising my hand to sort of give my opinion on Director Spears' comment. Um, just from my perspective, that's what would benefit from having a discussion, maybe a, a sub-regional forum where we could talk about different potential paths forward and how to expend the funds to restore service as quickly as possible. And like people could identify their highest priority areas, right? Like I heard tonight for the first time, um, you know, what the director from Erie was interested in and the director from Lyons. And so I think we would really benefit from a discussion. Um, and, you know, I, I know the staff uh, does meet regularly and talk about a number of issues. Um, and, you know, our staff in Louisville has been working really hard on fire response and recovery and, and we don't have, you know, multiple, multiple transportation departments and things like that. So uh, when things come to our various boards, while in the bigger areas, maybe people are briefed and have these different processes, but it really comes down to if the director um, that serves on that board has done their homework and read the packet and found out the information for themselves, and then we update the rest of the council on what we're doing within the framework of our legislative agenda and policy. Um, so within our community, like we haven't had a chance to weigh in on this. Like this is the first discussion um, we've been able to participate in on this, and I think we would benefit from a further discussion. Um, like at the sub-regional forum. So we could talk about potential paths forward. Even if we were to move forward with Director Levy's um, proposal tonight, I have concerns on whether or not once, let, let's say we did approve this POP, I have concerns about whether FTA would find that this is consistent um, with the intent of the grant um, because they have to look through this different programs. Like our, uh, our county is not a transit agency. There are a lot of steps you have to take um, to ensure that you're receiving the funds correctly and you've done your due diligence and al even allocating them to these other agencies, um, they weren't necessarily providing these services and they weren't necessarily cut in the pandemic. 
Um, so we don't know at this point if these funds would be able to be allocated until FTA reviews it, whereas if it was going to RTD, it would be very easy for them to allocate it because they could use it for any number of things like we've heard tonight um, to stay in the transit business. And a huge problem for RTD that they've conveyed at least to us in Louisville is this driver shortage. And so they have indicated like, yeah, they would love to restore some of these routes, but they can't get enough drivers. So um, there are complex issues. And I think by working together, we can solve them. And, and I just don't feel that we've worked together on this yet. Thank you, Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a couple of points. Um, the FTA has approved the POP as appropriate use of these funds. Um, so the, the, you know, we don't need to be concerned that, um, you know, that, there, that this is an appropriate use. Um, you know, there are a lot of what ifs and what ifs and what ifs and what about that, um, you know, and, and all of those raise doubts. But, you know, let's worry about the things that are, you know, actual, um, actual problems and um, the, the program of projects that we have put out for public comment uh, has been approved by the, P by the FTA. And so that's not one that we need to be concerned about that about. As I said earlier, um, we, uh, we are happy to continue engagement. And if the communities uh, within the small UCAs don't feel there's been adequate engagement, if the projects that were outlined in our letter um, are not the projects that the community wants, we're happy to hear other ideas. Um, but these, these are the projects that we were aware did need funding, the jump out to Erie, uh, service to Lions. Um, if there's been a problem with our engagement with Lions and they don't want us to use these funds for the Lions Flyer, we'll, we can look at alternatives for that. But these are the services that we were hearing within our community for the connectivity within Boulder County um, that was missing that, are, that the residents of Boulder County would like to have restored. Um, but we are more than happy to continue that engagement and, and entertain other projects as well. Um, but I think what you heard from the FTA is that um, Director Liu would have to reconsider her uh, request that Boulder County apply for these funds. She would have to reverse that decision uh, for these funds to not to be directed to Boulder County. And I don't anticipate that happening. Thank you. Uh, Director Teal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, considering there are uh, other projects that are on this agenda item that um, um, do do appear worthy of uh, consent approval, uh, if it does please the board, I would like to make a motion at this time to approve uh, agenda item 7-II, um, perhaps 7-2. Um, uh, removing the Boulder County Transit Operating Assistance item from this agenda item uh, so that the Boulder Subregional Council can have additional time to consider courses of action. Second. Right. I'm sorry, who seconded that? I didn't, I didn't hear that. Ashley. I do. Okay. Uh, Director Stolzman, I think, said that first, right? Oh. Okay. Uh, what I'm hearing is, well, let me hear from, a, we have a motion on the, on the floor. Uh, Director Teal, I was going to solicit actually a similar motion that we at least move the consent items forward uh, and then we can focus on the boulder. Uh, we could always do a, a motion to add that to the tip at the end of this discussion as well. Uh, but before we take a vote, let me, uh, let me hear from others who, who want to be heard on this. And Director Walton, this is your first time up on this, I believe. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate uh, Mayor Stoltzman pulling this from the consent agenda. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, it takes um, directors, um, you know, feeling comfortable and asking questions to be sure that you have the information that you need to make a decision. And clearly there are some open questions. Um, I am in support of the motion on the table. Um, I would just like to share that um, I, 
I feel like the information that probably staff and those working on the process to get this item to where it is probably know more and um, of those answers, but we should take the, the time and the opportunity to put this project, the eligibility of these funds into context of the RD <coughs> plan, because I think that's kind of where I'm hearing most of the, um, in the questions that you're asking as it pertains to uh, you know, how it fits in the region. And this is the forum for that. Um, all, most of the comments that I'm hearing tonight are from Boulder County communities. Um, we, of course, are invested and very interested in this. I came to this meeting um, tonight to support this as written and, and included in the packet um, because my I have been briefed by the Lafayette staff who has been participating in the conversations and the meetings um, for several weeks now. And um, and when um, when the questions came yesterday, um, there was quick action to um, to try to provide some quick answers. Um, and so probably the best course of action is to um, have a sub forum meeting, make sure it's on the agenda, make sure we're inviting the appropriate people, um, whether it's you know, putting it into context of RTD, um, perhaps having FTA also um, at that meeting. But, um, but I think get really clear um, among the Boulder County folks. And if there is, um, you know, a different path that we want to come back as a sub forum to recommend to the board um, or to, um, to the governor and Shoshana Lou about where these funds maybe um, maybe should go, then we should do that. But I think that there is a very strong case that this slice of funding, as I understand it, and as I've been briefed by the Lafayette staff, um, really does overall um, benefit the region. Um, I do have I do have a question that I would bring to that further conversation to understand. Um, more about RTD's plan for all of the funds they maybe have been given with the ARPA funding and um, you know how things have shifted over the last two to three years, how maybe this has created an opportunity for RTD that isn't the, the first course of action um, to maybe restore service that's been cut during COVID, but more what is the vision on if by restoring um, these routes and these local um, kind of connections in a particular local community that then maybe takes um, cars off of some of our larger regional highways, what is our TD's plan to help support these moving forward? Because we all know in the Northwest portion of the RTD district, we're feeling a little slighted. That's not a secret, right? So, um, so I think that that is kind of an important question on if we do this now, what is RTD's commitment going forward with some of these funds to keep these routes going um, and to raise the question and the concern um, that Director Stoltzman has about the restored service, if that's a, ever is going to be a possibility, um, because those are also um, equally as important to this part of the RTD district as well. So I would be in support of the motion um, and I, I appreciate the conversation and I look forward to getting together with the Boulder County sub forum to, to um, discuss more. Thank you very much. Uh, Director, uh, Director Levy took your hand down. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, I see no other comments. Let me just uh, as chair make a few <clears throat> comments here at the end. I heard from many of the Boulder County directors, the directors from the municipalities and from the, obviously from the County Commission, uh, but I've heard a lot of a lack of consensus and a desire for more discussion. As a director from uh, Denver, I usually, when there is uh, little to no risk of uh, to the funding itself, which I understand from Mr. Beckhouse, uh, that a, a one month delay to allow more conversation would not uh, put, put the, uh, the allocation at risk. 
uh, if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. Uh, I would always defer to the local communities that are not part of my community to discuss among themselves and come back to us. And so I tend, I would tend to support uh, Director Teal's motion. Uh, Director Harrison, do you want to uh, comment on that as well? Yes, I think obviously there's there is a lot of discussion around, and, and I'm always one to try to, as a member of all the of Erie and, and all the various old communities are here in the sub regional forum. I'm open to having that discussion in regard to and having taking more time so we can discuss it. I think the distinction, at least from my perspective, is. You know, maybe the question is, if, if it had gone forward and the money was allocated, the conversation and, and the, the concerns that are being addressed by my fellow directors, those conversations were still be ongoing, according, you know, I would be still be going on. We'd still be having them to try to address that. that that's my understanding. And I see Director Levy's uh, head nodding up and down. Um, but if it's something where it's not impacting funding and it's something that we can wait for a little bit so we can get a consensus, that's, that's helpful. The only concern is I don't want to be here six months from now or a year from now because it's still going around and around because I'm trying to understand where we're at. Um, but I think having FTA involved in those discussions also, what I would like to see going forward if we were to delay is having the information provided by the committees and Dr. Cog, what their feedback was in regard to that, so that the sub kind of the sub-regional forum can have all that information at their fingertips and read it. Um, so I'm trying to find a, a median path here so that we can get a consensus here instead of, you know, Director Levy and I being alone out here on an island. Um, I'm all for trying to compromise, not so much compromise, but have a, a consensus driven discussion. Um, that's where I'm coming. So Thank hopefully. you. Thank you. Uh, Director Teal, this is reminiscent to me, correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, uh, that this sounds a lot like the mobility hub discussion down in Castle Rock a few months back uh, where we pulled that out and delayed that and allowed uh, Douglas County to come back with a with a consensus. But go okay. ahead. With you. I, I swear to God, uh, the chairman and I were not texting uh, that <laughs> because that know your exactly, that's exactly what I thought. And, and uh, you know, it, for those of you that recall, I actually did have to recuse myself uh, when it came before the board for consideration um, because of an active land use application. Um, but that's very much uh, the case. I was just thinking the exact same thing, Kevin. And so, yeah, I do think it would be, um, again, I do speak in favor of the motion. I do think that is the correct course of action. Chair, um, um, part of, uh, um, I, I, I can make it a formal part of the motion, but I would suggest uh, that the executive director uh, should perhaps take a position of facilitator uh, in terms of uh, assisting the uh, Boulder um, sub-regional uh, committee in convening in order to consider this. Um, that can, I'm, I'm happy to amend the motion in order to make that formal or would merely proffer it as a suggestion uh, in, uh, in the spirit of this motion. I, okay, I think I would prefer the latter. I think I would prefer the latter uh, because I don't know that that would be something the Boulder County communities would would want or would uh, deem uh, something that they should be obligated to do, but certainly it's something that would be available to them. Uh, so I, I would just I would just leave that on the floor as a as a suggestion. Uh, in that's in, in uh, that in that case, Mr. Chair, I speak in favor of the motion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Beckhouse. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, regardless of the decision that FDA will be available, we've been uh, meeting with Boulder County on a regular basis every couple of weeks to work through a lot of the technical details about how to become an FDA grantee. Um, um, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Excellent. Thank you. Director Levy? Yeah, thank, thank you. I um, Two things. I guess one is um, I, I think I need to understand um, you know, we're once this, it, 
you know, if this comes forward as a TIP amendment, um, it's my understanding that the board of Dr. Cog will not have any further role in the decision as to how these how these funds, these small UZA funds are used. Um, um, I believe that's the case. Uh, and uh, and I uh, welcome somebody to correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, but I also do just want to set expectations for um, this discussion at the sub-regional forum, if that's the direction that we're going. Um, because I, I think um, the, uh, trustee our director Harrison from the town of Erie said it correctly you know we're we're not done taking public comment and shaping the program uh, the program of projects and so it's you know it's it's really going to be the same conversation we would otherwise have um, but what won't be on the table is returning these funds uh, rejecting them um, and not providing these services to the residents of Boulder County um, and, and again, just for expectations sake, um, if, if Boulder County were not to um, receive these small UZA funds, we would not have the funds for the Lions Flyer, for Ride Free Lafayette, to support the hop service, uh, to support uh, the extension of the jump for all of the things that have been outlined in that program of projects. So. Um, you know, I just want to set expectations for what uh, well could come out of this sub-regional forum. But um, but if it's the direction of this board to take it to a sub-regional forum, I believe we already have one planned um, to discuss the usual topic of sub-regional forums. We can expand the scope of the sub-regional forum um, and. Um, you know, and uh, hope to come back to you with um, with support for this proposal. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Director Spear. Thank you. Um, I think I just have one more question that I would like to understand um, while I consider my decision on this. What are the circumstances that would put this funding at risk? So is there anything about having this conversation um, at the sub-regional level without having um, first approved a TIP amendment that, that would put the funding and service restoration at risk because it it, it is a, like here in Boulder, for example, we have a lot of people um, who ride the bus in from neighboring communities in Boulder County to get to work, um, to get to school. And I, I just want to know that making this decision isn't going to, you know, come back and, and lead to a loss of, of services for them. Thank you. Uh, can who can answer that? Can Josh or uh, Mr. Beckhouse answer that for us? I might defer to FTA, but my understanding is so long as um, the funding meets the requirements that Mr. Beckhouse provided, or the deadline requirements that Mr. Beckhouse provided earlier, and meets the other FTA requirements, that it would it would not be at risk. But I would ask for him to confirm that, please. That's right, the funds are available until September 30th, 2024. Um, you know, the um, it, there may be a short delay to the FTA's ability to make the grant. Um, and then, um, you know, that kind of would kick off some of the contracting work that the Boulder County has planned. I don't, I can't speak to the timelines for, for those things and when service would be implemented. Um, I think there's a number of different implementation dates for different different items in their in their package, but there's no there's no immediate danger of funding's uh, lapsing availability. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That's very good to know. Uh, given the length of this this discussion, I think we might be bumping up against that September 2024 deadline, but I think we still have some breathing room. <laughs> Director Stolzman, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the comments and the, and the most recent question by Director Spear. I think that what I was trying to talk about is uh, potential. So we we have already been asked by RTD what types of um, projects we feel like we can cut because of the supplanting of these funds and conversations about supplanting of future funds. So while I agree with the answer that these funds are secured to be designated to Boulder County, I think that the way that this has been done puts other 
routes at risk. And I think it would be better to have the conversation so we can come up with a collaborative way to move forward so we don't have to identify um, those reductions in service that we've been asked to identify. Thank you very much. Um, there's one thing that's giving me just a little bit of heartburn. I just texted Melinda. Uh, let me ask you, Melinda, uh, it gives me a little heartburn that uh, Director Shaw Superior was not able to speak and I no longer see him in attendees, but I do see three phone call attendees. Uh, do you know if any of those is Director Shaw? Has, uh, did he try to come back in? Uh, to my knowledge, I do not. Uh, obviously, I've been monitoring both lists uh, just to make sure uh, if there's anyone who knows the last three digits of his cell phone number that he might be calling in on. We do have one phone number on file, and it does not match any of the numbers that have called in. None of those are his number. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Sultan. Okay. Thank you. That, that said, it does. Uh, I do have a little heartburn, as I said, not hearing from uh, one other Boulder County uh, representative in this. Uh, but uh, are there any other comments or questions on this before we uh, take a vote? Uh, seeing none, I want to let folks know that it takes 19 votes, majority of those present and voting, to uh, adopt a motion. So with that said, uh, Melinda, I think I'll ask people to raise their virtual hand so that you can count them. All those in favor of Director Teal's motion, which is to approve the tip proposed tip amendments uh, uh, other than the Boulder County Transit Operating Assistance, please uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, Melinda, do we have a count? Oh, I see 28 hands. Oh, no, that's easy. Zoom counts it for us. But even better. Uh, it looks like 28 in favor. Any, uh, uh, take your hands down, please. All those who are opposed to, I'll wait for the other two. All those who are opposed to the motion, please raise your virtual hands. I'll give it a few more seconds. I see only two. And that sounds, uh, well, actually, since we have more than 19, uh, the motion will pass. Are there any abstentions? Uh, put me down as abstaining as a chair. Thank you. Uh, so the motion passes. Uh, that uh, concludes that item. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody for a really, really good discussion and a really good look at the process in an area that, uh, that as being in Denver, I have not been involved in. It's very interesting for me to see uh, uh, the, or hear this discussion. Uh, next up is uh, informational briefing. Uh, Jacob Rieger is going to talk to us about the 2050 RTP greenhouse gas analysis. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. Um, I think you should be seeing the presentation in presentation mode. So want to continue Jacob, our conversation. Yes, sir. Jacob, could you hold on a second? Uh, Director Smith of Arvada asked if we could take a three minute stretch break. Would anybody be object uh, objecting to that? I could use a three minute break myself. Uh, let, let's uh, be in recess until 835. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Director Smith.
All right, uh, Jacob, thank you for indulging us. I appreciate that. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. And Jacob, uh, go ahead. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, good evening, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog, wanted to continue our conversation on our work related to the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, greenhouse gas analysis. Uh, we've been talking a lot about mitigation measures and the mitigation action plan, proposed mitigation action plan. So wanted to further that conversation this evening. Um, so starting out, um, I've used the analogy of a layer cake. Um, I don't think this looks exactly like a layer cake, but we wanted to um, just sort of remind and summarize that over the last six months, we've been talking about a lot of different strategies um, that we've been putting together as a framework um, to be able to meet the emission reduction levels in the state greenhouse gas rule uh, through our uh, what will be our revised 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, so all the concepts that you see here um, on this graphic we have been talking about over time. Um, so just a reminder of sort of the multitude you've heard me say it's not going to take two or three or five things it's going to take 10 or 15 or 20 things. So just a reminder of that concept and the mitigation measures at the bottom of this graphic, mitigation measures are sort of that final, um, final last thing that we do to help close the gap uh, to be able to meet the emission reduction levels. Um, in terms of the mitigation plan overview, we've started talking about these concepts. Um, actually, let me just kind of go through so you can see this all at once, so excuse me. Um, as I said, it's needed as a last step to close the remaining reduction level gap. Um, it would detail our region's approach, again, at the regional level to using mitigation measures as part of the greenhouse gas analysis. It would report and analyze measures at the regional level. Um, again, this is, you know, our regional transportation plan is regional. So um, our focus here is at the regional level on mitigation measures. Um, as we've talked about, and we had this discussion at our board work session together um, earlier in July, um, we anticipate implementation of any of these mitigation measures in really in a small fraction of the region in strategic and applicable geographies. And if you'll recall at the board work session, I showed the interactive map of, of those geographies. And even those are just conceptual. Um, they're not even required in those geographies, really just a mechanism to kind of help us sort of understand where they might be applicable and, and the reduction levels associated with that applicability. Um, and then a final point here uh, from that regional perspective is there is ample opportunity to implement successfully over time um, to help achieve compliance. Um, as you'll see in a moment, we do meet the reduction levels for the 2025 analysis year. So the, the first analysis year for which we're even aiming for with mitigation measures is 2030. So we have time to implement, we have time to course correct and adjust over time as we, as we do this work together. From the local perspective, um, again, let me just get these bullets out so you can see them, Oops, excuse me. Um, altogether, um, as you've heard me say sort of multiple times, and I do wanna emphasize mitigation measures and the mitigation action plan are entirely voluntary from a local government perspective. No requirements here, no, no directives here. Um, not required to implement any particular measure in any specific location. Um, again, these are more illustrative, um, you know, sort of voluntary things that um, that we think maybe together we can do as a region, but there's no mandatory component. Um, because we need to report annually to the Transportation Commission, we will develop um, a tracking mechanism with local jurisdictions um, so that we can report over time just what is the activity in the region on these mitigation measures. Uh, we, entire, you know, we anticipate entirely that over time, you know, we might need to course correct or adjust in terms of maybe some measures turn out to be easier or more popular to implement. Uh, maybe some don't apply the way we all thought they would. Um, so that annual reporting mechanism, that requirement gives us the opportunity to course correct as we go. 
um, and based on the region's implementation progress. So table, a lot of numbers in this table, you've seen a version of this before um, as we're getting sort of close to being final in our analysis, just a reminder really, um, first of all, the measurement component is million metric tons, kind of an odd measurement, but that's the measurement uh, framework in the greenhouse gas rule. Um, so we're standardizing the information we're reporting out to be in million metric tons, which is why you're seeing a lot of decimal points. Um, a reminder here, I um, won't go through every single bit of this table, but just as a reminder, um, as defined by the greenhouse gas rule, um, we start with our baseline, which is defined in the rule again as our 2050 plan as adopted in April of 2021, and as we modeled that plan when we adopted it, that really sets our baseline. The second row is really the work we've been doing of all the strategies that I showed you in the layer cake diagram, all the things we've been talking about over the past several months as part of the greenhouse gas analysis. Um, you can see sort of the numbers associated with that work. Um, and then in the third row, the modeled reduction from the baseline. So once we know our baseline and once we know um, kind of the, the potential strategies, uh, we can see, you know, sort of, again, that modeled reduction from the baseline is defined by the rule. Um, we've also been working on a component called additional programmatic investment. We've talked about this a little bit before as well. Uh, we're trying to direct even more dollars in our fiscally constrained financial plan associated with the 2050 plan towards you know, some of those non-project specific but really important connected tissue type investments, bike ped, um, complete streets, sidewalks, you know, those sorts of things that really help traffic signal timing, um, that really help us meet uh, the emission reduction requirements and really help support um, the overall plan. So we're including those as well. When you add all of those together, you get the total reduction from the baseline. And then we compare that to the reduction levels that are set for us directly in the greenhouse gas rule. And we see whether there is a remaining gap or not. As I alluded in 2025, we do meet the reduction levels with the proposed framework of strategies. But for 2030 through 2015, uh, we do believe that we will have a gap. We know we'll have a gap um, that we're proposing to meet through uh, the mitigation action plan. Um, you've also seen a version of this before. These are the proposed mitigation measures that would be included in the mitigation action plan. Um, it shows their reduction, uh, GHG reduction levels. This comes from policy directive 1610. Um, that's um, CDOT has passed, the Transportation Commission has passed to help implement the GHG rule in terms of mitigation measures. Um, we use the methodologies and the scoring um, and the reduction calculations within PD 1610 um, to estimate the potential reduction levels associated with each of the individual reduction measures and then for the proposed mitigation action plan as a whole, um, the grand total at the bottom. I will note, um, because these are smaller numbers, again, it's meant to fill that gap. Um, here, we just wanted to show you actual metric tons, not million metric tons. Um, so just a note for there in comparison with the larger table. Um, and then also we wanted to show you this, not really my intention to do math um, in an open board meeting. I'm certainly happy to take questions on it when we get to questions. But the point of showing you this is that wanted to help you visualize how a mitigation measure would appear in the mitigation action plan. Think of this as almost like a cut sheet, so to speak, of how a measure would be profiled in the mitigation action plan and the requirements that, that we have through the Greenhouse Gas Rule and Policy Directive 1610 in terms of showing our work and the analysis and the scoring related to each of these mitigation measures. Um, so just picked one of them as a profile just to show you um, kind of, you know, that we tried to do our homework on the technical analysis, you know, associated with the measure itself and the potential applicability of the measure um, and how that would appear in the proposed mitigation action plan. And then finally, um, again, I'll go through the bullets here, um, wanted to show you our what we think is our pretty close to getting final schedule in terms of the end of the road for completing this work and going through our public comment period and our adoption process. Um, as our chair announced earlier tonight, we have set a public hearing for September 7th uh, for, our, you know, for our public hearing. Um, that would be preceded by a 30 plus day uh, public comment review period. Um, that would start on August 7th when we publish the legal notice in the Denver Post and start our public comment period. Uh, we'll be making presentations and doing activities during uh, those 30 plus days to, to solicit input and uh, sort of get this out to the region. Um, we also have some requirements again from the GHG rule about submitting the GHG transportation report and the mitigation action plan to the Transportation Commission. We would do that in early August. Uh, we would also submit in early August um, some of our technical work and our technical assumptions associated uh, with this greenhouse gas work to the Air Pollution Control Division at CDPHE. 
Um, that is a requirement of the rule as well so that they can review it. Um, again, public hearing on September 7th, and then um, our Transportation Advisory Committee, Regional Transportation Committee, and um, board meetings, as well as the Transportation Commission, um, going through that process um, and our process for um, adoption of the revised 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, uh, which we anticipate asking you all to do at your September 21st board meeting to meet the October 1st deadline. So wanted to keep this pretty short and simple, but um, wanted to provide that further information to you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you for being very concise with this. We've obviously, been through a lot of other briefings, and this was a very good uh, summation of where we stand right now. Very aggressive schedule, and thank you to staff for all of your work on it. Director Namella, go ahead. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm on my phone, so video not working. Um, so a question, just two questions regarding the assumptions uh, piece. So it was a little confusing as I was looking at it, um, so I'm hoping that it can move a little bit to towards more clarity on how you're cal making these calculations. Um, two things that would help with uh, some clarity and probably a little more trust in the assumptions is to one, understand what the vehicle miles traveled reduction is associated with each type of plan area that you've identified for mixed use because some are transit areas with transit and others are um, kind of the urban center, pedestrian oriented development areas, which are not necessarily transit. So I'm assuming those vehicle mile travel uh, reductions would differ on those. So that would be helpful for our staff to be able to evaluate. Um, and then the second thing that is not overly clear is how you're treating, um, you know, whether these areas are rezoned and that's adequate enough to get these GHG reductions, or if you're assuming some portion of redevelopment is occurring. I see that there's some assumption for redevelopment occurring over the next 30 years, but I was, it's just not clear how that applies to 2025 and you know the initial rezonings. And so there's just um, maybe a little work to be done on your, um, on your cut sheets there. Yeah, thank you, Director. Appreciate that feedback. <clears throat> I think it will be a little bit more clear um, once we publish the sort of entire mitigation action plan and the information, the analysis, and the data that go with that. Um, but just to just to attempt to answer your questions briefly, um, again, part of this relies in, in large part actually on the scoring mechanisms and on the calculation mechanisms within Policy Directive 1610. We're actually using that as, as sort of our mechanism to be able to make these calculations. So we have more, we will have more information in the mitigation action plan about kind of those requirements and that scoring methodology um, to be able to do this. But in a nutshell, without getting into a lot of math, I think the strategic point is that we're trying to make some conservative but reasonable assumptions about how these measures proportionally would apply in sort of each fraction of geography, because you're right, they could be different in urban centers versus around transit stations. So for each of those geographies, we're trying to make some educated best guesses and data and analysis around how much, how much it would apply proportionally within each of those geographies. And then from there, then we're making assumptions again as sort of fractions of fractions around, um, even within those fractional geographies, how applicable this would be. I think a common misperception is that um, this isn't necessarily about units in the ground per se. I think obviously the hope is that as a region, as we continue to do these things, it leads to in the case of development or redevelopment units in the ground. But in terms of the actual mitigation measure, it's more about the policy perspective of what a local government would choose to do, again, voluntary, but would choose to do in terms of designating areas for rezoning or um, you know, rezoning or redevelopment or transit oriented development or whatever it may be not directly the, the units in the ground or the development activity that would occur based on those actions. So again, it's more about the front end uh, policy actions that local governments would take. That's how the mitigation measures are structured within PD 1610. So I hope that helps a little bit. A little, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, other questions, comments? This may be the shortest greenhouse gas uh, item we've had in any meeting. I can't believe it. Uh, let me just ask uh, uh, Jacob, uh, voluntary uh, land use approaches. 
uh, adding density. I think the first bullet was, uh, if you could go back to that slide. Oops. Measure, do, 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 do. Okay, one more. Okay, it was the one that talked about adding density. Um, I think it's uh, important, at least for me to state that uh, dens density should be added where mobility investments have been made and not just, uh, not just density anywhere. Uh, I, I think of Houston, for example, uh, but uh, where we have invested in transit and in, in alternate modes of mobility, it makes sense. But if you were to say double the density in single family sprawling suburban areas, you've only doubled the number of people who have no alternative but to drive. Uh, so that would be counter to our, uh, our goals, uh, uh, at least in, from my perspective. Uh, uh, Director Coombs, go ahead. Um, yeah, so as someone who lives in a single family sprawling uh, part of the region, um, I would actually make a plug for looking at a combination of density and mobility investments that make it so that within your community, you're more able to get to the things you need to get to, right? So commuting is not the only source of uh, our greenhouse gas issue. And in fact, um, our day-to-day grocery trips and things along those lines um, make a huge impact. And so I think I understand the point and I don't entirely disagree, but I do think that there are some important ways that we can make changes to the structure of our neighborhoods that would enable us to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions even within our sprawling suburbia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Director Chair. Merrill. Yes, uh, Jacob. Oh, did you... Yeah, I'm sorry. No, just um, I wonder if I could respond to both of your comments because I think they raise an important okay. point. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, just want to clarify from the perspective of the mitigation action plan. It really is a balance. We're using the geographies and we're using the geographies again as a mechanism to sort of, you know, that appropriateness. If we're looking at transit oriented development, we're looking at half mile round rail stations. If we're looking at redevelopment, let's say we're kind of, you know, looking at areas where that might be a potential for that to occur. But the geographies, as we talked about in the board work session, are not meant to be limiting. Um, again, they're a mechanism that we used as sort of a proxy to estimate the potential level of how much of this activity or how much of this action might occur over, you know, by 2030 or by 2040 or by 2050, but they're not constraining in the slightest to, um, to the other director's point, to Director Coombs' point, that one of the things that we'll be interested in is we start tracking this over time, where are these things actually occurring? And we may find, um, you know, when it comes to redevelopment or some of the other mitigation measures that, you know, maybe they're occurring where we thought they might, they might be occurring in different places. And we're going to be really interested in that and, and sort of adjusting as we go to account for what's actually happening and how they're being implemented. So again, the geography is not meant to be constraining. It's meant to get us started, but there's flexibility as we go. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, additional information. Appreciate it. Uh, Director Namella, go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks. I just wanted to second um, Director Coombs' point and and maybe uh, to, to Jacob's response that we are clearly identifying how we're going to be measuring these um, for success. And, um, you know, in, instead of just having mitigation measures to be thinking about policies and, and direction for communities to focus in on creating complete neighborhoods, um, to the point of trying to get people not necessarily on transit, but you know, to amenities and things that they need so that we are actually um, achieving what we're saying and hoping we're going to achieve. Um, and the other thing I'm not overly excited about, about hearing is that we're, we're still in the guessing mode. I think there is a lot of data to support and, and kind of verify some of these um, numbers and some of which is already existing in our region. And so I'm, uh, I'm hoping that there will be some really solid data that is being presented alongside these assumptions. 
um, for the Denver region, but there are other regions where we can look at some parallel numbers um, and just, again, to, um, I, I just want us to be successful, but I, I, I want these, these approaches to be realistic. And um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> I think you get that point <laughs> where I'm at, but I appreciate your, I, I appreciate it's been a lot of work to get to this point already. So thanks. Certainly, thank you. Director Stolzman. I agree with Chairman Flynn. Thank you. I wish more people would say that. <laughs> uh, any other comments or questions on this? Uh, Sarah, your uh, uh, director Nermella, your name is your uh, hand is still up. Do you have another comment? No. no okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jacob, and thank you, uh, Doug, for your entire staff and all their work on this. Uh, it's very difficult, and we're yeah, we're still not there. Uh, next up is item nine, uh, which was scheduled for 7.20. Uh, so if you're on Alaskan time, we're still on schedule. Uh, 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, informational item, item 10. Administrative modifications to the 2022-25 Transportation Improvement Program. This is an informational item. Uh, the packet is in there. I've gone through it before the meeting. I hope everyone else has had a chance to do that. Uh, we don't have a presentation on it, but it's there for your information. Uh, item 11, uh, committee reports. Uh, first is from uh, Nick Williams from the stack. Uh, Nick. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, stack met on July 7th. No action items, three information items. First up, a 10-year plan update, overview of the greenhouse gas compliant process, uh, going through a similar process as we are with our RTP uh, on there. Um, uh, some revisions to the plan reflecting some new state and federal revenue, greenhouse rule requirements, and uh, reflecting progress on delivering projects in the first four years of the plan. Second was a I-270 project update. Uh, this is a project to replace eight bridges on the I-270 corridor between York Street and uh, uh, Vasquez Boulevard, utilizing bridge, tunner, bridge and tunnel enterprise funding as well as SB 267 funds. Uh, and CDOT will be requesting approval to proceed with design for all eight bridges subsequent meeting. And finally, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program update. Uh, this is a federal program uh, that requires uh, a plan in place by August 1st, uh, 2022 under the IIJA. We're expected to, as a state, receive 57 million in formula funds uh, and some uh, hopefully be successful in some other discretionary funds. Uh, draft plan of that NEVI, National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program plan is now available. Public comment due this Friday at 11.59, if you don't have any plans yet for this Friday. That concludes my update, Mr. Chair. I believe you're still on mute, Mr. Chair. I've been going back and forth because I was told I was creating static, I apologize. Uh, Director Starker from the uh, Metro Mayor's uh, Caucus. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. The uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus has not met since our last uh, meeting here, so we have no further report. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> MAC is continuing to focus on homelessness, our priority issue. We met last Friday the 15th to debrief um, what we heard from the last two meetings from uh, most of our members about what they're doing. Um, and we debriefed on key themes and potential opportunities for MAC that are uh, particularly unique to counties. While we've only just scratched the surface about opportunities, one solidified opportunity is a regular um, I'm sorry, regional data sharing uh, agreement of some sort that will allow the seven metro counties to share data regarding homelessness. That's especially relevant today with the release of the most recent point in time numbers. Once the data is accessible, we can begin identifying trends on a regional scale. Um, we're going to be taking a break from our regular meetings next month, and we're going to instead host a social hour 
and uh, time, date, and location will be coming up. We want to make sure that MAG members continue to build and maintain good, strong relationships. That's what makes MAG strong. Uh, we're going to resume our regular meetings in September and continuing discussing other things that MAC can do. That concludes my update. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Advisory Committee on Aging. I've been told that they did not meet this month and, and don't have a report, but Jayla, you are here. Uh, no, that's, that's what I was going to tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I inadvertently gave you a report for you. I'm just trying to be more efficient here. Uh, report from the uh, Regional Air Quality Council, uh, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Air Quality Council met on uh, Friday, July 8th, and uh, we welcomed some new members that were appointed by the governor to, to the board um, as well. But the big item of the, of the day was a uh, presentation on the draft 2022 ozone state implementation plan. Um, that is to be acted upon at our, at our August meeting. So we're excited to get past, past this uh, big milestone. And then from there, we'll go on to the legislature and, and, uh, when the session starts. So that was, that was the big thing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next up is a report from E-470 Authority, uh, Director Mulvey. Good evening. Uh, E-470 met today, uh, this morning. So you have the fresh information here. Um, they are now marketing on LinkedIn. They're also marketing um, some way to, to uh, change your account over if you need to um, because of the license plate tolls and the more, uh, more of the uh, express lanes. Um, they reported uh, support for us with our first bike to work breakfast station. So we are very appreciative of that. They approved a uh, contract for road widening of um, I-7 to 56 on the 470, of course, four month stretch. The plaza work in that does include a trail extension, which our region would probably appreciate. They also approved um, some new core rules, which are basically consistent with some updates in the law and some uh, relatively pro forma data center contracts. And that is all. Director Mulvey. Next up, a uh, report from CDOT, uh, Director White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a few quick things tonight. Uh, as Director Williams mentioned in the SAC report, our focus is much the same as Dr. Cog's in terms of achieving compliance with the greenhouse gas standard and the related updates to our 10-year plan. So we uh, have been working our transportation commission through our analysis, just as the Dr. Cog staff is, is uh, presenting this work to the Dr. Cog board. The couple other things then I will just mention tonight, we do have a new chair of the transportation commission and a new vice chair. The chair is commissioner Don Stanton. He represents Jefferson County and the vice chair is Gary Beatty, who represents the Eastern Plains. It's sort of the tradition of the commission to alternate between a uh, more urban uh, representative as chair with the vice chair being rural and then flipping back and forth. So that's where we are now uh, with the chair of uh, Mr. Stanton. Uh, the third item I will just note a little bit um, more of a, a somber, um, somber topic, but we are seeing uh, a real uptick in fatalities uh, in the metro region, our region one we're about 25% higher than we were last year in terms of fatalities. So a disturbing trend that I, I know we're seeing across the metro area um, and uh, lots more to work to do on that. That's it for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director White. Is CDOT undertaking any uh, uh, analysis, uh, any uh, what the trends are with these uh, fatalities? Are they different than what we've seen before different circumstances or just more of the same causes that that'd be something i would be i don't expect an answer but that's okay. a shock that's a shocking shocking figure vision zero indeed thank Lots you speed out there yep yes uh a report on from rtd uh mr van meter um i believe you uh want to uh, talk not only about fast tracks but about uh, general items from RTD. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Given um, the time, there are only a couple items that I'll um, 
um, bore you with or actually raise your attention. One is related to fast tracks, and that is just a quick update for the board to let you know that um, the local government jurisdictions and stakeholders along the Northwest Rail route um, are um, their staffs are being engaged in um, a series of meetings have been all along, um, but um, now with the consultant team and really starting to engage in terms of getting the Northwest Rail peak service study um, off the ground and operationalized. And there's a, a large kickoff meeting with local jurisdiction staff, RTD and the consultant team scheduled next week to um, um, really set the groundwork and framework for that study moving forward. So wanted to provide some assurance that that project is still front and center and moving forward um, from RTD's perspective. The one other item I'd like to bring up because it's the date is rapidly approaching is the RTD Zero Fare for Better Air, the Zero Fare uh, initiative scheduled for August 1st through 31st, all RTD services, including FlexRide, including um, ADA and paratransit services, all RTD services um, will be zero fare for the entire month of August. Thank you very much to the Colorado Energy Office and um, the um, Colorado legislature passing um, Senate Bill 22180, providing funding for RTD and transit agencies throughout the state for um, zero fare programs. So just wanted to highlight those two things, more information and uh, a information and ad campaign are, is being prepared and rolled out by RTD. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Van Meter. Looking forward to seeing what the results are from the zero fare uh, pilot. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next item is uh, administrative items. The uh, next meeting is August 17th, 2022. Uh, are there other matters from any member that they would like to bring to the attention of the board and our colleagues from throughout the metro area? Please raise your hand. I see none. Uh, so it sounds like there is no other business to conduct here. So at uh, 9.06, we are adjourned. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thanks. 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 Thanks.